morning, everybody. Good, morning. Good to have you guys with us today. This is a, a continuing series that we're calling Weird. This is our third week in this series. And the whole idea of this series is to change the things about our life because we tend to go through life so much with just this, uh, this normal thought. I just want to be normal. I don't want to stand out. I don't want to do anything that is going to draw attention to me or anything like that. Uh, but what we're learning through this series is that the normal things of this world, the things that we tend to just accept at face value and do with our life and say with our mouth and all of that, uh, it is getting us nowhere. Our wheels are spinning. And so uh, we're doing this series to kind of change and shift and become weird or different or set apart or just something other than uh, what's going on in this world. Now, let's get into it. You ready? Okay, so here we go. Uh, I'm gonna, I haven't started a fight in a while here at the church, and so I want to start a fight today, uh, and that's okay because we're leaving the country tomorrow, and so uh, we're going to talk about politics today. Politics. Who's excited? Not me. I am <laughs> a little bit nervous and scared. This actually might be the one day where people stand up and walk out, and so that's fine. You know, if I don't have a job and I come back from vacations, what? My watch is talking to me. It's on mute and do not disturb. I don't know what's going on. So we're going to talk about politics. Now, i got to be honest with you. I am not a fan of politics. In fact, I hate politics. I don't like having the discussions. This is me personally. I don't like doing any of that stuff. And that's because of, uh, I just think politics are such a terrible thing for us to get into because politics divide. I'll show you, like, this is about as political as I'll, as I'll get. <laughs> That, I don't care who you vote for. That joke is funny. But also, I think this one, this is also really funny. So this is a more democratic-leaning church, I guess, than by, by the laughter of the pictures. And you, ever, you ever lived with an HOA? Yeah, that's the face that you get whenever you want to paint something. All right, so anyway, let's get it. That's about as political as I'll get. And the one reason, the very specific reason that I don't get super political in my life is because politics... Divide. Politics divide, they divide, they divide. If you don't believe that, just look at any poll about how people are voting in our country, and it's about a 45 to 45 percent split with 10 percent of people going, I don't know, like I don't know what's going on. And so politics are a, uh, a very divisive topic, a very divisive subject, um, but I think it's something that we need to get into. Now, the state of politics in our country right now is like an unruly kindergarten class. If you are not seeing that, um, then turn the news on for five minutes and you will see that. It is uh, what we are seeing from our adult grown human leaders is exactly like what you would see in a kindergarten class when the teacher is pouring the milk into cups and somebody has a little bit more milk and they throw a fit and the, like the cup gets thrown across the room. And just the way that our politicians are speaking to each other and parents, if, you, if your kid talked to another human being the way that our politicians are talking to each other, you would be appalled by that. You would be so embarrassed if your children were speaking to some other human being the way that our leaders are talking to each other. It is a divisive subject. And so what I've seen in my life with politics is that it consistently, consistently divides. How many of us in the room have lost relationships or have had arguments or somebody's thrown a turkey against the wall at Thanksgiving because of vehement political disagreements. A lot of people have had uh, family rifts happen that seem irreparable because of talking about politics. All that being said, I believe that it's still something that we need to talk about. Politics involves real people with real flesh and blood, with real hearts, and it involves real issues. Now, I want to lay a baseline for our discussion on politics today, and it's this. Jesus must be our first priority. Shocking to hear in church, I'm sure. Jesus must be our first priority. What I need you to understand about this statement, it is not a useless platitude. 
It is not something that I'm just saying because it's what we're supposed to say. We get taught this in Bible college or anything like that. I'm saying Jesus must be our first priority because that is what the Bible teaches us. And that if we say we belong to Jesus, if we say we're going to give our life to Jesus and Jesus is not our first priority, we are hypocritical. And so the world would look at us and say they don't even believe what their book says. So Jesus has to be our first priority. We have to get weird when it comes to politics because normal politics and policies, they are not working. Here's how I see it going down. And usually I see it happening on social media. Somebody posts something and somebody writes, oh, that's dumb and so are you for believing that. And then somebody writes, no, you're dumb for not believing that. And then somebody goes, nuh-uh. And then somebody says, nanny nanny boo boo, stick your head in, whatever, all right? Normal when it comes to politics is reading the title of an article, getting all fired up, writing some comment about some dumb thing and doing all that and starting a fight on social media when you've not even read the content of the article. This is normal in our social media politically driven thing. We have got to make a change. We have got to get weird when it comes to politics. Now, the reason why is very simple. No matter what our political leaning or view, we have to understand that there will always be a tension between our political views and what God actually says. Okay, let me just leave that up there. I want to just take an aside real quick. I'm speaking for myself right here, okay? <laughs> we are leaving the country. <laughs> if you say, yes, I follow Jesus, I've given my life to Jesus, I believe in Jesus, and I would say that. I've given my life to Jesus, I follow him, I believe in him, I want everything about my life to reflect him. And your political views are higher than that statement, you will constantly be at odds with the Lord. You will constantly be at odds with God. There will always be a tension between our political views and what God says. And today I'm going to tell you why. Okay, so in the Bible, in 1 Samuel chapter 8, the Jewish people, they've come out of slavery and uh, they've, they've gone to the promised land. They are where they're supposed to be. And the Jewish people, the Israelite people, ask for a king. So they go to Samuel and they say, Samuel, give us a king. Now, who is Samuel? Samuel was a prophet of God. And a prophet is just a speaker for God. Somebody who God gives them a message and then they give that message to their people. That's who Samuel was. He was a prophet. Now, prior to the Israelites asking for a king, God was seen as their only ruler. We have to understand that. Before they, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 8, before the Israelite people asked for a king, God was seen as their king. God was seen as their ruler. It was a fantastic system. God spoke to Samuel. Samuel spoke to the people. God was in charge, and that's the way it was intended to be from the beginning. So that's why there will always be tension between a political party and God. Because it was intended for human beings from the beginning to only be ruled, to only be governed by what God says. And so now that we have the system that we have, there will always be tension. There will always be tension. People were never meant to have a political system. So when God created us, there was never meant to be a system other than God. No wonder politics is so divisive. The Jewish people in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 7, they asked Samuel for a king, and Samuel went to God and he was asking him about it, and God says this. He says, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. When the Israelite people asked for a king, God saw it as a rejection of him. When they asked for a king, it was a rejection of God. God was already in charge. 
God was already providing for his people, and he saw that as a rejection of him. It would be like if you all one day said, you know what? I know we have a pastor, but we're going to go get a new one. And now I know that will never happen because you love me so much. <laughs> but can you imagine how slighted I would feel, how rejected I would feel, how hurt I would feel about something like that? Put yourself in that situation, all right? You're sitting at your desk at work, all right? You're sitting at your desk at work, and then your boss comes by with somebody and says, hey, uh, you know, we're shopping around your position. Just want to let this person see where you sit and what you do. And you're sitting there like, what the crap is going on? Like, I thought I had this job. You would feel rejected. Same thing would happen if your spouse came into your house and said, hey, this is, uh, I'm thinking about bringing this one in. And you go, ah. It's not a good idea, right? You would feel rejected. And God felt rejected when Israel said, we want a king. We don't, hey, I don't know if we want you anymore. We want a king to rule us. The people rejected God as their ruler in favor of something far lesser. And that's a problem. And for us, when we elevate a political party or a political platform over the Bible, it is nothing more than a rejection of God, a continued rejection of God. And so the Israelite people ask God for a king. God says, you want to reject me and do that? Okay. And so a man named Saul is who the people chose to be their king. By all human accounts, Saul was the perfect choice. He was tall, he was strong, he was attractive, he was from a wealthy family. If we, if we take those qualifications and look at a lot of our politicians, we go, eh, okay, yeah, I can see that. Tall, strong, attractive, wealthy. And those are generally the people that we still choose. And so this is who Saul was. He was all of those things. But the issue with Saul, the problem with Saul, is that he repeatedly and habitually did the opposite of what God wanted. Repeatedly and habitually, he overstepped his authority. He lied. He ruled tyrannically. He made excuses for his poor behavior and brashly, brashly neglected to do specific things that God told him to do. Saul was more concerned about popularity than he was about pleasing God. He promoted himself through manipulation. And when he failed, he blamed other people. And this is what people traded God for. You probably hear a lot of things that are very similar to our political system now. And that's what they traded God's leadership for. Human beings traded God's leadership, God's perfect love, God's provision for something that failed spectacularly. And we might be sitting here thinking, how could they be so dumb? How could they be so dumb to have traded God's perfect love and perfect leadership for something lesser? And I would suggest that we do the exact same thing when we choose to sin, when we choose to go against God, when we choose to put the Bible lower than our political beliefs. It's a rejection of God all over again. So Saul continued to mess up over time, and God ended up removing him from authority and gave his kingdom over to a man named David. Now, David would have been our last choice. Who in here is named David? Yep, you would have been our last choice. <laughs> David in the Bible, not that David. <laughs> David was young, he was inexperienced, and he was very short. So that's how the Bible describes it. But he was also handsome. The Bible says he was young, inexperienced, short, and handsome. Think uh, like a young Tom Cruise. All right, by the way, you know Tom Cruise is four foot six, right? That dude is short. He's a very short man. But here's what God told Samuel, the prophet, about David. Look at this verse in 1 Samuel 16. Do not consider his appearance or his height. Why? For I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the what? Outward appearance. But the Lord looks at what? It's a rough statement. 
It's a rough statement. Don't, don't look at him. I've rejected him. Just want to let you know this dude is short. <laughs> By the way, I don't know if short people, I apologize. I don't know what to say about this passage. I have no idea how to do this for you. All right. But as time went on, David became the model leader of Israel for one reason and one reason alone. He was led by God and he sought God in everything that he did. David was weird, not because he was short or inexperienced, but David was weird because he wanted God more than he wanted anything else. He wanted God more than he wanted anything else. His goal was to honor God, to seek God, to make God famous. And, and by the way, David was not perfect. Okay, if you know anything about the story of David, he committed adultery and he killed that lady's husband. So not a perfect dude by any stretch of the imagination. But the difference is when David was confronted with his crimes, he repented, he turned away from that stuff, and he owned up to it. And he took the consequences. Now, that doesn't make it okay, but it is to compare and contrast what who Saul was and who David was. You guys tracking with me on that? Saul was not the guy who, when he got caught, would say, oh, you know what, I did it, I, and I feel terrible, and I'm sorry, I'm never going to do this again. I give myself back. That was not him. When David was caught, when David was found out for what he did, he repented. He fell on his knees. He gave himself back over to God. Saul sought his own fame, and David sought to make God famous, even through his mistakes. These are vastly vastly different approaches to politics. We need to be people who are weird like David. People who are weird like David. People who put God ahead of everything else, even our political beliefs. We need to put God ahead of our political beliefs, ahead of our political party, ahead of our own wants and desires, ahead of everything else. God needs to be ahead of everything else. I hope that's not like super shocking for you to hear me say that. Here's how Jesus told us to do it in Matthew chapter 22. This is how we put God ahead of everything else. Jesus said the two most important things are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two <coughs> commandments. Love God and love other people. Please note, the most important thing you can do with your life, according to Jesus, is to love God with every aspect of who you are. That is the most important thing that you can do with your life. And the second most important thing Jesus says is just like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus does not say in that passage, love your neighbor when they agree with you, vote with you, believe like you, look like you, act like you, think like you, do like you. That is not what Jesus says. Jesus says we are to love our neighbor the same way that we love ourselves. We are to think the best for them, to do the best for them, to the point of my own sacrifice. And so when Jesus says to love your neighbor, please note, there are zero pre-qualifiers there. This is how we put God ahead of our political system. This is how we put God ahead of whoever you're going to vote for. Which, by the way, at the end of this, I'm going to tell you who you should vote for. <laughs> <laughs> this is what Jesus wants us to do, to love God and to love other people. And there are zero pre-qualifiers for that. Yet here's what I see. Politics divide and Christians speak unloving and unkind words. I've recently seen on someone's social media, on Facebook page, I'm tired of your stupidity. That is unloving. That is unkind. That is ungodly. Now, I see, I saw some of you look at your spouse like, was that you? Did you just say that? <laughs> so listen. Yep. If we say, if we say, I love God. If you can say, 
I love God. And you treat anyone, if you treat anyone poorly, the Bible calls you a liar. And the Bible says that the love of God is not in you. To take that just a little bit further, Titus chapter 3 says, Warn a divisive person once, then again, then have what? Nothing, Nothing to do with them. And in, in danger of dividing the room, I think there's people that need to pay attention to this because you might be flirting with the line. I'm not keeping a list or anything, by the way. Dan is. Not me. When we treat people poorly, we are rejecting God. And treating people poorly includes being a tool on social media. But when we treat people poorly, we are rejecting God. So what does this have to do with politics? I think everything. I think it has everything to do with politics. So what do we do about politics? What do we do about our political system? The New Testament tells us that we are to honor our leaders and pray for them. Do you also know that there are zero pre-qualifiers for that as well? We are to honor our leaders and pray for them. How you doing? How you doing with that? A lot of people are bold, man. A lot of people are bold. But we ignore what God has blatantly told us to do in favor of being right, in favor of pushing our own agenda, whatever it might be. Above all else, this. Jesus wants you to be faithful. Jesus wants you to be faithful. Love God, love other people. Love God, love other people. That is what Jesus has called us to be faithful to. To loving God and to loving other people. And so I have a question for you. Are you willing to put your faith filter ahead of your political filter? Are you willing to put your faith filter ahead of your political filter? Okay, so I want to say a couple, three things, three more things, and then I'll let this tense moment pass. <laughs> so glad we're going to the country tomorrow. <laughs> We're going to hide. We're going to have to hide after this, right? Okay. All right, so let's get weird about all of this. Let's get super weird about politics. I'm going to give you three things you can do to be weird when it comes to politics. First one is this. Uh, you can disagree politically with someone. We can disagree politically. In fact, I know that this church disagrees probably half and half politically because I see what you write, and I have conversations with you. And so I know that even in this church, we can disagree politically. It is okay to disagree. It is not okay to be divisive. There's a huge difference there. You and I might have a discussion about something and end that conversation on opposite sides of the argument. And you know what? That's okay if we did not dishonor one another during that conversation. We can disagree politically and not be divisive. And so, all right, I, I started this whole thing with I hate politics. I'm not a fan of politics. That's me. You, if God is calling you into that world, into that arena, then by all means go. Like listen to what God is leading you to do. If you need to wade into political waters, go and do that. I'm not going to do that. That's just not who I am. I honestly don't care about it. I don't care who our president is. And I probably shouldn't even say, I could not care less who is leading our country. I'm just being honest with you. And I know some people are going to be upset with me about that, but I don't care. I want to be faithful to Jesus. And I know that if we are faithful to Jesus and we give ourselves Jesus, no matter what happens in Washington or in Albany or wherever 97 layers of government are here in Liverpool, I don't, whatever happens there, if we are faithful to Jesus, even if we die, we will be okay. So I'm not going to get into a lot of political discussions. Never will I get into a political discussion on Facebook. 
But if I am going to get into a political discussion with you, or if you're going to get into that conversation with someone else, I want to encourage you to do it face to face. Not even texting. Do it face to face. Have a conversation face to face. You can disagree politically with someone face to face. It's a lot more difficult to be a tool to somebody when you're sitting across the table from them. Isn't it? Right? Social media has produced a bunch of cowards who feel empowered and emboldened by their keyboard or on their phone when they're sitting on the toilet to write some dumb thing and make everybody mad. And it is, it is only productive insofar as our country is being split in half. Our churches are being split in half because of these disagreements. And it's embarrassing. So disagree politically. But respect and love someone while you do that face to face. That's my that's my thought. All right. I, I went on a tangent. I'm sorry. Please come back to church next week. <laughs> Number two, love unconditionally. Uh, some of my closest people in my life, I disagree with completely politically, like 100 percent straight up party lines could not be farther apart politically. But that does not stop us from loving each other unconditionally with zero pre-qualifiers the way that Jesus told us to do. So you can disagree with someone politically and, and you can love them unconditionally. We don't have to agree in order for me to love you or for you to love me. We don't have to do that. So we can disagree politically if we're going to get weird. We can love unconditionally. And third, we can pray for unity. We can pray for unity. And I would say, don't just pray for it. Don't just pray for unity. Fight for unity. If, if you are in a conversation with someone face to face, or maybe there's three of you and someone is being uh, divisive in that conversation, take action. Hey, I think what you just said is divisive. confront people face to face yeah that's the way we're supposed to do it so let's be people who pray for unity did you know that that was basically the last thing jesus prayed for when he was on this earth in john chapter 17 he says this i pray that all of them may be one one i pray that all of them may be one so that Okay, so that the world may believe that you have sent me, he's saying to God, so that the world may believe that you have sent me, I pray that they may be brought to what? I don't know, like, how about like 60% unity? How about we just strive for that? Absolutely not. Jesus wants us to be brought to complete unity. And you know who he's talking about in this passage? All of us. People inside the church. People inside the church. He wants us to be unified. So that, so that people who don't know Jesus would look at us and say, man, I want that. I want that. I want to be with those. I want to be like what they're doing. Man, they love each other even though they don't agree. That is dope. This is what Jesus prayed for his people. And this is so we won't be divisive. So we can disagree and still love each other unconditionally. We could be the generation that prays for unity, fights for unity, and sees it happen. And it'll start as a small cluster of people. But that'll grow. When Jesus came to this earth, I want us to all be very clear. He did not come with military force. Although he could have. When Jesus came, he did not choose a politician or a king to side with or support. The people actually wanted him to do that. They wanted him to overthrow the Roman government. They wanted Jesus to get involved politically. But Jesus did not get involved politically for one very simple reason. Politics is not what saves us. Politics is not an eternal thing. People wanted him to conquer the Romans, but he didn't because the Romans were not the real enemy. You know who the real enemy is? It's the devil. It's Satan. 
And so Jesus didn't come to conquer some political party or to set up some political system or anything like that. Jesus came for one reason. And look at this right here, what Jesus said he came for. I came to seek and to save that which was lost. Guys, if you can't be convinced from why Jesus came as to what our focus is as Christian people, then I, I don't know if I could, I don't know if I could help. I don't know if I could help. This is why Jesus came to seek and to save the lost, because that's the real enemy. That's the real issue. The real issue in life that we have to deal with, that we must deal with, is the sin that we commit against God, that separates us from God, that pulls us apart from God. And Jesus came into this place, into this earth, so that that gap between us and God would be filled by what he did on the cross, so that our sins could be forgiven, because the real enemy is death. It's not somebody who disagrees with you. So today, we're going to go into communion. The actual physical symbols that we will hold is just a cup of... Uh,